that was an amazing se session with Eric Gleiman from Ramp. Uh, it's hard to beat that intro uh, where Eric was, uh, was, was speaking in Mandarin. Uh, but we're super honored to have you today here, Matt. Uh, over the years, you know, we've had founders of companies like DoorDash, Firm, Cloudflare, and today we have Enduro, Fair, Ramp. You know, they've, they've talked about their stories of taking their idea and building a multi-billion dollar company out of it. And, and I really enjoy those stories, but we know it's not always up and to the right when you're building a startup, you know. When the chips are down and those founders are staring into the abyss uh, and they can't turn to anybody else, they turn to you, right? You've coached the CEOs of Coinbase, Robinhood, OpenAI, many, many legendary companies. I'm really lucky that you and Alexis have taken, on, taken me on as a client. I've learned a lot from you two. And I wanted to share some of those learnings with the audience here today. We, we have had over a thousand founders that are just getting off the ground that are in that zero to one phase join different sessions in their live today. Um, so I'm really excited to have you, have you today. Uh, just like a good therapist, uh, I won't ask you to share any specific names or details of, uh, of these conversations unless those founders themselves have shared it publicly. Um, so, so with that context, uh, let's tighten our seat belts. Let's go. Matt, let's start at the top. Uh, is there, you know, you've coached all these amazing legendary founders. Is there one thing that you have done in, the, in your sessions with them that you found to be the most impactful across your mentees? Yeah, there absolutely has. Um, so when I first started coaching, it was very pragmatic. It was very much like, okay, what's your most important thing? What are the steps you need to take to get there? Great. Let's schedule time for you to do these things. It was just very pragmatic around identifying steps towards priority and making time to do those actions. And then me checking to make sure those actions got done. And then of course, you know, people ran into obstacles. And what I started to discover was that the biggest obstacles that founders ran into, um, they, the founder got gripped by fear and their brain turned off and they just froze and they couldn't go forward. And I realized, wait a second, like we can do all this planning around priorities and all this tactical stuff around how to do one-on-ones and team meetings, how to make decisions, but it just doesn't matter if the founder, when it comes time to doing, gets paralyzed. And so what I realized was, is that fear and anger both emanate from the amygdala and they grip our brain and they start giving our brain really exaggerated and frankly, bad advice, particularly fear. And fear says, don't do anything. Fear is trying to prevent us from acting because what fear is associated with is physical danger. And, you know, when there's a, a saber toothed tiger, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, yeah, don't go into that cave because you might die. But now the dangers are not dangerous to the physical body. They're dangerous to our ego or perceived dangers, but they're, they're all inflated. They all, they're not real. And so we have a fear of hurting people. We have a fear of not being liked. We have a fear of our investors abandoning us. We have a fear of our teammates abandoning us. We have a fear, but these are all made up fears. And so we don't do the thing that's right for the business because of a fear that we have that is ancillary. And so what I do with my founders is I share this with them. They believe it conceptually, but then when it actually comes the moment, um, when you know they're, the, the moment is this person is not performing, but they're frankly a, 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 a woman of color and they're the only woman of color on my executive team. How do I give her this feedback that she's not performing because if I do, she might get really angry and then she might, you know, go to the New York Times and have a, a front page article written about me that I'm a racist and then my whole company will, will implode. Well, of course, it's crazy talk. I mean, what, what the reality is, she doesn't even know she's not performing because you're not giving her feedback. If you give her feedback, the likely outcome is she'll say, wow, thank you so much for giving me that feedback. I want to perform as best I can. Now I know what to do. That's the likely outcome, but fear says the exact opposite. So what I do is I make bets. Whenever I see that one of my founders is in fear, first of all, I tell them, then I say, okay, we're gonna make a bet. We're gonna make a bet that you say, if you do X, A will happen. Well, I predict 
that B will happen, usually the exact opposite. And we'll see who wins. And if I win, then from now on, whenever I perceive you in fear, to be in fear, you have to listen to what my brain is saying because I'm not in fear. Like it doesn't, I'm not in your company. It's not directly impacting me, but you are. And so I make these bets and I've made hundreds of these bets and I've never lost. And the reason I've never lost is not because I'm a genius. It's just because I'm not in fear. Like these founders could make these same bets with their mother, their sister, their coworker, their friend. It doesn't matter who they make this bet with. Everybody can see it, but the person who's in fear. That's it. That's the most impactful thing. And it spans across every founder that I've ever worked with. You know, I can totally relate to this because uh, fear is such a, 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 an emotion that's so deeply entrenched, right, in our DNA. It's like, conceptually, I hear you. But in that moment, it's that reptilian brain response that it takes a lot of effort, right, to be able to get ahead of it, right? That's when right. I started a company many years ago, I had a fear of failure because I, I, the opportunity cost for me to, you know, say no to a six figure job, you know, I, I have immigrant parents, you know, I'm a first generation immigrant myself, came from very humble beginnings. To be able to have this offer from these top tier companies was, and to say no to that and instead go, you know, when I'm already broke, but start a company on top of that, not pay myself. It's, it was that fear of what if I fail, right? Doing this, am I going to look foolish to myself, to my parents, to everybody else? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think you're recognizing that founders are human, you know? And I think that you've, you're acknowledging that we understand that you have this emotion, but you're helping the founder almost see themselves in third person, right? With the, the, with the bet, you're basically saying, let's, Let's abstract out and let's look at the situation as an observer. And you're saying, here's what, what is going to happen. I think that is, that is, that is helping. It sounds like your, your clients. That's right. Yes. And, and, some, and, and sometimes it's pretty radical. The, 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 the feeling that the body has just a few days ago, one founder called me and, and there's a certain person that they needed to let go. But this is the first executive that, that the founder is going to be letting go. And he was in a panic and he, he couldn't. He literally said, Matt, I feel like I'm going to die and I, I can't do this. I just have to delay. I've got to put it off. What I shared with him was that his, this was his pattern recognition, that this felt like disappointing another adult. Well, the last time he disappointed another adult was, you know, what we all did when we were children and, and, and disappointing an adult when you're a child is a really bad idea because they're bigger than you. They're stronger than you. They can hurt you. They can punish you. They can do really consequential things to you. And so as a child, we learn to not disappoint adults. But then when we become adult and we need to let somebody go, yes, we're going to disappoint them, but we need to do it and we need to help them find another great job, figure out what their passion is, where they can really succeed, help them find that role. But we still have to move forward and let them go. Otherwise, the organization suffers. And he literally couldn't, couldn't move forward. And I said to him, the only way you're going to get out of this panic is to put yourself in that situation and then realize it's all going to be okay. Or you can take drugs or alcohol or, you know, and just keep numbing yourself, but then your body will break down and, and you won't go anywhere. And so I got him, I, what I did was I got someone else to sit with him while he let this person go. And he texted me two hours later and said, Matt, that was amazing. I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm basically, I'm completely over. I'm, I'm like, I'm the, the anxiety and the panic attack is just completely and utterly gone because he realized, yes, the person was sad. Yes. Nobody likes being let go, but the world didn't end. She didn't die. Nobody died and life was fine. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing is that we, if we do the thing that we feel fear about and then realize the consequence that our brain is making up doesn't happen, then instantly that anxiety and panic go away. But you have to face it. You have to go into it. You can't go the other direction, run away from it because you'll still be in panic. And again, drugs and alcohol are the worst thing to do because all they do is mask the pain. That's right. Very temporarily. That's right. Carlos just shared an interesting quote in the chat. He said, fear kills more dreams than failure ever will. And I think it's totally so agree. true, uh, especially as we think of starting a company. 
right? It's such a daunting thing to bet the farm, right? To start a company. And I, I meet so many incredibly talented people that have amazing ideas, but they just won't take that leap, right? That's right. And, and I think that is what prevents, the, you know, keeps them from greatness, from building that, that company. And I think a lot of times people think it's the idea is not good enough. It's like, look, it's never the idea. Good ideas are diamond dozen. It's your fear of like, the failure, whatever it is, it's holding you back. Uh, and and look, I don't want to diminish how hard that is. It is a very true fear because I've I've faced that myself. But there are ways to to navigate around that, right? And, and what you're saying is it doesn't have to be necessarily just a coach, but it could be other people in your life that could help also help you help you navigate that, help you see the the, the reality from what might be a figment of your imagination. That's right. That's yeah, exactly. I, want, I want to talk about um, is something that Naval Ravikant shared uh, publicly. Uh, he uh, he started AngelList. He's very famous for that. Uh, but he came to a point in his career with AngelList where he, I think he was not feeling like this was what he was excited about getting up in the morning. And he felt a little bit lost. And he turned to you and he came to you and you helped him kind of unpack uh, what you call sort of the zone of genius and helped him realize that perhaps he's not best suited to be CEO day to day, but perhaps a different role. Can you share that story a little bit with the audience? And specifically, I want to understand your framework around Zone of Genius and how that, how us as founders can can use that. Yeah, sure. And the reason I can share this is because Naval has already shared this publicly. We did a podcast together and he told the story. So now I can also tell the story publicly. Um, so what happened was, this is actually very early in my coaching, and I was mostly coaching Stanford students. And then one sort of recommended me to Naval, and Naval came over to my house, and we sat down, and I said, what's going on with you? What's, what's, the, what's the issue? And he said, Matt, the issue is, for the past 10 years, I've been running AngelList, and I don't like it, um, but I have to do it. I, I can't not do it. I'm the famous guy. I'm the one that all the investors are counting on. I'm the one that brings in the deals because I'm the well-known name. So I've got to keep doing it. And I listened to him and I said, bullshit. I think actually you suck at it. And someone else would do a much better job than you. And the reason I say that, Naval, is because you don't love it. First thing you told me was you hate it. And it's impossible to do a job really well if you hate it. In fact, it's impossible to do a job really well if you don't love it. And Naval, you clearly don't love it. But there's someone out there who does, and they will do a phenomenal job. And then AngelList will run really well and become even more valuable. And you then, of all, can go do what you actually love to do. And you may not even know, but you'll at least have the space and time to discover it. And he thought, Matt, this is crazy. That's impossible. But I, over talking a little bit more, an hour and a half into it, not only was he convinced, but he said we had a roadmap of steps to take. We did it. And over the next six weeks, he... Um, replaced himself with Kevin Laws, and now there's uh, another CEO and who's just absolutely crushing it. And the company now has taken off, and the latest value I think was something like five billion. And uh, and Naval now has the space and time over the past years to go and do what he's truly passionate about. And lo and behold, what has he created? Uh, he's created I think three different companies in that space, at least two, but probably three that all have done incredibly well. So he's created tremendously more value outside of that role. And the company itself has created much more value with someone else in that role. But this, this plays out many times over where if someone's doing something because they think they have to, frankly, they're doing a shitty job. And if, if they're willing to let that piece go to someone who loves it, everybody wins. And tell me about the framework. You have these four different sort of zones that founders yeah. operate or people operate. In. What are those four zones? So the four zones are one, your zone of incompetence. This is something where other people are better at it than you are, like fixing your car. There's a mechanic of that there is just better at it. You should let them do it. Second is your zone of competence. This is something that you can do fine, but other people can do fine too. Like, I don't know, cleaning your house. You can probably do that, but someone else can too. And so let someone else do it because your time is actually more valuable. Then there's your zone of excellence. This is what you're really good at. People really value about you. And you probably make a lot of money doing it. This is likely your job, but you don't absolutely love it. This is the danger zone. 
because you are better than other people at this. People want you to do it because you're creating value for them. They pay you a lot of money to do it, but it's not quite at your zone of genius. Your zone of genius is what you absolutely love to do and are uniquely great at, but you haven't, but are you really doing it? So it, it's scary to move out of your zone of excellence, which you're getting a lot of uh, sort of accolades for and money for, and to stop doing that and to open up space for what you truly love to do and give that the time to breathe, to grow into the creation that you give to the world. So again, Naval stopped the thing that he was excellent at, which was, or, you know, his fame was attracting uh, companies and investors to AngelList. And once he let that go, he then got to, he didn't know what he loved, but he had time to go explore. And then he started exploring things. And lo and behold, he found, discovered things that he absolutely was passionate about. And those things then mushroomed into tons and tons of value creation. And as he describes it, his life, I don't know, was like a three out of 10 when he was a CEO of Angelist. And now, as he says, it's an 11 out of 10. And uh, he's just like, wakes up happy every single day and is happy and energized the entire day. That's when you know you're in your zone of genius, when you feel like that. And of course, the, the, the irony is when you feel like that, that's when you're creating, actually creating massive value that you can monetize or not monetize, but you can easily monetize it. Right. And, and I would say founders have this luxury even more, right, than if you're an IC, right? As a leader, you can, as your company is scaling, you can delegate, right? You can bring Absolutely. in people into your company that perhaps are better suited to do something or more excited about doing something than you are, right? And as a, That's right. even though CEO technically stands for chief everything officer, you don't have to do everything. Right, you should be doing things that are in your zone of genius, not in your zone of excellence. And I think there's another uh, example that Enrique from Brex shared publicly, where you encouraged him to get a chief of staff because he yeah. re he realized he wasn't good at writing, right? Mm -hmm. But he said, "Look, that doesn't that that's that's a good nice to have. You can bring in somebody else who might be really good at it. You you can still be a great CEO and maybe not be a great writer yourself, right?" And I think helping founders have to realize where their strengths lie, where their competencies lie, but also what they enjoy doing, right? Yeah. And I think it's when, you're, when you're enjoying something, your best work comes out versus just doing something that you're, you're good at. Yeah. Well, what I found is with almost every founder that I coach, they have a certain personality type. And the personality almost always is they're really excited about discovering problems that people are experiencing and then figuring out a way to solve that problem. That's creating product. That's getting to product market fits, getting from zero to one. Then once they get to product market fit, now they've got to hire a whole bunch of engineers to build more features, customer support people to take calls from customers, more salespeople to go sell to more customers, marketing people to make the entire market aware of what this product is. So now there's this huge team that starts getting built and they've got to manage this huge team of people, each of whom has big egos, big emotions, needs to feel heard. Yeah, everyone, like it's managing, it's, a, it's like a big, fa a growing family and it's geometrically more complex the more people that get at it. And so there's a lot of process required of meetings with agendas and everyone pre-writing and uh, communicating decisions out to people. And it's a lot of checklists. And it's a lot of, and almost no founder that I coach loves to do that. And so the key is bringing on and pairing with someone who is a process person, who themselves could never figure out how to solve, you know, figure out what the customer's problem is and solve it. They could never build the product, but now that the product is built, they absolutely can write all the checklists, check all the checklists week after week after week after week. And so that is usually a COO, but you can start with hiring a chief of staff, someone who simply just is very organized and simply shadows the founder until they understand all the context about the customer and the product and how the company runs. And then they can go take all the one-on-ones, take the team meetings, basically operate the company and everything in between with, with Enrique, the example was he didn't like to write with some of the founders. They don't like to operate. Now Enrique and Pedro are a great match because Enrique is such a personable and relationship guy. And Pedro actually loves to operate and does a great job at it. Most founders don't have that pair. Most founders have one or the other that they miss and therefore need to bring someone in to do 
to create that complete picture. Interesting. And, and, and I want you to share a personal story of yours where you found your zone of genius where you started, a, was it a production company movie and you're now helping ex-convicts? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that initiative and how you kind of discovered that? yourself? Sure. I'm not sure it's zone of genius. It's, um, it's more that I started a company back in the day called Totality. That was a financial success. Then I decided I wanted to go have fun. I didn't really know what that meant. I surfed a while, decided to make a movie, made this movie down in Brazil, a documentary, which ended up doing well. Got won the Tribeca Film Festival, got shortlisted for an Academy Award. And, but then I realized that I had, I had so much fun. I just didn't want to have fun anymore. And it felt like I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> I was like full drowning in fun. And then I realized, well, what else is there? I don't want to go make more money. I, I don't want to have more fun. You know what? I guess the only thing left is sort of doing good. But what even does that mean? Like, I don't want to write checks to a philanthropy um, or a charity. I want to like get my hands dirty. I want to do what nobody else wants to do. And I thought to myself, well, who does nobody else want to help? Well, nobody wants to help violent convicted felons. Like they're scary. And I don't know anyone who helps them. So what the movie that I'd made um, was about the drug war in the slums of Rio. And I'd realized that the people who join the drug gang in, in Brazil, they're, they're not bad people. They just live in the slums and they never had any, any education, any job skills to get a regular job. There's no schools in their slums. And so they do what they need to do in order to make money, in order to buy food, in order to eat. Turns out everybody's human and everybody needs food to eat. And so I thought, thank God I live in a country where you know, there's, there's schools everywhere. And the only people that commit crime in my country are, you know, sociopaths. That's what I thought. Then I came back to New York and uh, did another movie about amateur boxing, heavyweight boxing. And most good amateur heavyweight boxers live in the South Bronx. They congregate there to practice, to train against each other. So I spent a lot of time in the South Bronx, which is again, another slum and, uh, and realized, oh my God, there are schools here, but they're so bad. They might as well not exist. It's the same dynamic. If I was born in this neighborhood, I too would join the drug gang because that's the only legitimate job. I, not legitimate. That's the only job I could get that would put food on the table. Right. I thought, oh my God, this is crazy. These people are rational actors. They're not sociopaths. They're doing what they need to do to survive. So could I help them get and keep a legitimate job? And of course, growing up in, in, the, in the ghetto, most people get criminal records you know, very easily. And so once you have a criminal record, no one's going to hire you because you've you ever, it takes, costs $35 to do a background check. Every employer does a background check. And if they see you've got a criminal history, you don't get the job. The other person doesn't have it. Who doesn't have a criminal history gets the job. So I thought to myself, well, we need to find industries where there's such a shortage of supply that the employers just don't care. They'll hire freaking anybody who's got the skill. What are those industries? Construction? truck driving and farm labor. Well, I was in the city, so farm labor doesn't count. Construction is actually pretty difficult to train. Like you got to train hands-on, but truck driving, they're actually schools and you can just pay the 2000 bucks and someone goes to school and 30 days later, they get a truck driving license and they're good to go. So I started taking ex-cons and putting them through truck driving school and it worked. It worked time and time and time again. Um, eventually I, brought someone else in to go scale this and make it national. And now I think last year it was several hundred folks that we trained and next year it's probably going to top a thousand and just take it off. Um, but it's because, and the recidivism rate has been, I think less than 2% um, because again, once someone has enough money legitimately to pay rent and buy food, suddenly they don't need to do something illegal to get a place to, to sleep and food to eat. And so they don't, these, these folks want to live a legitimate life. Now they're able to. That's that, awesome. So that was really fun. I, I, I love that story because you could have easily just written a check, right? But I, you decided to roll up your sleeves and actually make an impact and actually get in front of these uh, convicts and, and, and help them get jobs and truly make a difference in their lives versus just throw money at the problem, which would be, maybe short-term right, but long-term wrong, right? And I think you you flipped the, flipped the equation on its head. So I absolutely love that story. I wanted to share that with the, with the, with the group here. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, across the CEOs you've worked some individual habits or perhaps you've helped them cultivate that 
have helped them become more effective and efficient. Anything you can share with the group and just uh, tidbits around best practices, because you're trying to accomplish so much. And no matter how hard we work, we only have 24 hours in a day. So you're constantly yeah. in this search of, of life hacking. Yeah. So you're not going to like this answer. Um, but I think that the CEO's primary job is to, one, describe the vision of where the company's going, where the product is going. So describe where are we going to be three months from now? Where are we going to be a year from now? Where are we going to be five years from now? Where are we going to be 10 years from now? Because everybody need, in the company needs to feel like they understand the North Star, where we're heading. And the only person really who has the authority to, and legitimacy to, to describe that is the CEO. And also the only person who really understands the customer problem well enough because they've understood it from the beginning. So they have to document that and share that with the company. Now, again, they don't have to write it. They got someone sit there next to them to write it, but they have to speak it. They have to say it. And that takes time. And you can't, and it has to be refreshed constantly. And secondly, the second job of the CEO is to resolve conflict within the organization. So head of sales, head of marketing, butting heads. Okay, boom, I'm going to resolve that conflict. Head of engineering, head of product, butting heads. Boom, I'm going to resolve that conflict. Problem is, you don't know when the conflict is going to arise. So if, as CEO, you're scheduled Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., well, when the... When the conflict arises, then they're not able to get to you. So then you, they have to wait, 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 and the conflict continues. So basically, as CEO, what you, the best CEOs that I coach have huge blocks of time available every single day, and even entire days with nothing scheduled, so that when a problem arises, boom, they're right on top of it, put out the fire that same day, organization moves forward. I have CEOs that take one hour naps every afternoon. Frankly, they're, they're the best. They're the best CEOs. Because what they've done is they've taken all the other parts that do require meeting, 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 meeting all day long, and they've given them to other people. Oftentimes they have a COO who's got the whole organization to operate. And that leaves them available huge blocks of time. Again, ideate about the future and document it, or jump on a fire when it appears. Yeah. You know, I know that's not the answer you want to hear. I, I love it because for me, and I'll, I'll share a quick story that's that's tangential, but adjacent, uh, for COVID and like working from home has been like an eye opener for me because pre COVID, I felt that you had to be at the office. And if I'm not at the office, like I'm, I'm being lazy and not working. Right. And now, because we were forced, we were forced last couple of years to work from home. It's like, no, it's more about, it's more important to be, uh, productive and creative and driving value than necessarily just being busy or just sitting at the office, just sitting at your desk or sitting in front of the computer. And I think right. it's what you're, what you're saying is having a chalk block calendar, it may seem like you're busy and may feel good because you feel like you're being productive, but that may or may not be the best thing for the company, right? Which is ultimately the North Star metric, what matters, right? And having these, like what I try to do actually on Wednesdays is not take meetings, right? Because I leave that time for for creative work, but also like last minute stuff that comes up. And the reason Wednesdays are nice for me is because like stuff comes up Monday, Tuesday, and then you have the Wednesday free already versus having to move stuff around, right? So it's like right in the middle of the week for me. And I think I think to your point, it's really important to to leave those blocks proactively and not feel guilty. Because I, I I'm I'm I feel guilty sometimes when I have these blocks and I'm like, why am I not having 20 meetings in a day? And, and Naval talks about this, I, I think I saw in one of his tweets, where we have a tendency to work, uh, I think he draws an analogy to like cows that are like grazing all day, right? You just got to sort of stay busy. And in his opinion, the right way to do it is more like how lions hunt, right? Which is when they're, when they're going for the kill, it's like all hands on deck and it's like, they, they you know, they pounce on it. And then they like rest for the, for the rest of the day and maybe the next day and slowly sort of work through their work through their kill. And I think it's it's important founders and humans kind of operate similarly because those bursts of creativity may come at any point in time, right? Uh, for me, it's a lot of times it's the shower or it's first thing in the morning. And, and I think it's important you give yourself those opportunities to have that have that come to you. And it's really hard to do that when you're when you're back to back all day. Actually I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on you, Gaurav. I don't think that creativity comes at any time. 
I think it comes whenever we allow our brains to get bored. And I mean, for a, a significant amount of time, because if we're in a meeting, we're reactive to the meeting. So our brain is engaged and you can't have like creative thoughts while you're listening to a meeting and, and making a decision. Se secondly, if you're out of the meeting and you're now responding to email or looking on your, your phone and you're looking at messages and your WhatsApp and Twitter, your brain is reacting to those stimuli. It's not relaxed and creating its own thoughts. And the way to create creativity is actually take away all the distractions, take away all the meetings, take away all the emails and just sit with nothing. And the first five to 10 minutes will be painful, physically painful, because each of these stimuli that we get are little hits of dopamine, little hits of adrenaline. It literally, it's a, it's a, it's narcotic and we get addicted to that adrenaline. But when the adrenaline isn't there, it can suddenly we can feel physical pain. But if you allow yourself to sit with it, have a meal without being on a phone, go to the bathroom and sit on the toilet without your phone. And again, for the first five minutes, it'll be painful, but then suddenly thoughts will start to arise. Problems that were occurring will start to think, oh, I could solve it this way. Oh, this other product we, solution, we could build that. That's when the thoughts will start to come. And um, so I do actually disagree that they come at any time. They come when you give your brain the space to get bored, distraction-free. Then the thoughts will come. And I think an important point there is give yourself enough time. Because, yes. like, for example, when I meditate, the first five or ten minutes, it's like almost worse than when I was not meditating because all these thoughts come rushing to your head. And you're like, oh, I feel even more stressed now because I'm like thinking all these things. And I think you need to like give yourself long enough time that that initial burst passes. And then you're truly in that, I guess, what you would call the boredom phase when all the other creative ideas uh, come to come to mind. Um, exactly right. I want to touch on a question that Vishal asked in the in the Q and A channel. Um, it, it, you know, how do the best CEOs enable their execs? How do they empower their leadership team? Are mm -hmm. there any kind of best practices uh, to really let them shine? Yeah. So let's make a distinction here. There's two very different phases of a company. One, when you're getting the product market fit. Two, when you're scaling. Let's never confuse the motions between those two because they're entire. When you're getting to product market fit, you shouldn't have executives. You should have a teeny tiny team because you have to keep iterating and you they throw something out and the customer goes, ah, that's terrible. And you need to change. You need to constantly. And, and there, you, the, the smaller you are, the nimbler you are because you all have the same information. You're all working together. I think, frankly, you should be two or three people until you get to product market fit. YC puts a hard limit on six. Okay, that's fine too, but I wouldn't certainly don't more than that. Then once you've built something that really resonates and really customers really love and really are paying for and telling other people about, now you can start to scale. Now, by the way, big warning, the more people you add, the more problems you will have. So I think the really exciting thing is to try to build a huge company on very few people. What, who, who's doing this? Linear, I think, has 20 people. Significant company at this point already. Uh, Notion, um, up until recently, you know, a few years ago, they were 25 people. Now they're more. Um, other, other companies are trying to be hyper-efficient. WhatsApp, obviously, was hyper-efficient. Uh, Instagram was hyper-efficient. Uh, we're talking less than 20 people when they had their huge exits. If that happens, you don't have problems when you scale because there's such few people. But if you start hiring hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people, now you're going to have big problems managing and keeping all these people informed and keeping them all motivated and keeping them all coordinated. Oh my God, the headache. And so what I found is the biggest problem I see is that most people as a CEO and this teeny tiny entity people are market fit, they're the decision maker on everything because there's not that many people. Then all of a sudden there are more people. The CEO stays the decision maker. And now decisions take forever to get made because the CEO is just is busy. It doesn't have blocks open, as we talked about, scheduled the whole time, Monday through Friday, eight to eight. So the answer, the simplest answer I found, there's a book called Turn the Ship Around um, about a Navy sub commander who effectively took a sub that was the worst in the fleet and uh, made it the, the best performing in the fleet. And the way he did it was one simple technique. 
he he was trained on this subclass, which he knew all the jobs for, but they put him in charge of another sub that he'd never been trained on and did not do anything. And so therefore he couldn't be the decision maker. So instead we said it was every department head. We said, whenever there's a decision to be made, whenever you're going to do an action, tell me, here's what I intend to do. Then give me a chance, like give me 24 hours to give you feedback. But if you don't hear from me, go ahead and do it. And what happened was each then department had suddenly got into the owner mindset of, hey, what should I do? And they, and instead of becoming, being passive and saying, hey, will you approve? Like it's your decision. They know, they said, Ooh, what, should, what really should happen here? Because I'm going to own it. And he said that half the time he didn't have a chance to give any feedback because it's still so overwhelmed. And so the person had to go ahead and do the thing they intended to do without feedback. But most of the time, again, he was informed. And so if he saw any glaring errors, he was able to let the person know ahead of time. But it was still the department head's decision. And he said, by creating this ownership mentality among all the department heads, and then they started doing it with their team leads, and those team leads started doing it with their ICs, everybody started thinking like an owner. And therefore, not only did the ship start to perform incredibly well, because there was no delay in decision making, also, he started to have, and he ended up having the highest rate of promotion to captain of any crew in the fleet, because every single department head was thinking like a captain. I think uh, this is where uh, like the Warriors basketball team, NBA team has done really well, right? Working together as a team versus just having, you know, individual superstars that perhaps don't work together as a team so well. And so much of it comes down from the coach, right? I think in the case of the Warriors, and you see that change in their, in their performance um, before and after Steve Kerr. Yep. Agreed. Completely agreed. One of the things you also talked about in your book that I want to double click on is uh, you said startups, you know, uh, that grow too early, too fast, you know, tend to fail more than perhaps the ones that grow too slow, right? Yeah. And I want to unpack this for a second because it's a very natural tendency once you've raised the money, once you start to see some traction to just go for it, right? 150%. We, we celebrate that in our culture, right? Work super hard, move really fast. But, but you're pushing back on that. So, so can you can you unpack for us uh, for a yeah, second? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole reason people reach out to me is because they're scaling their company and all of a sudden things are just breaking. And so you, you see which scaled companies have successfully implemented a management system that works because they're still around. So Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, they've all come up with a management system that works well because they continue to operate and succeed. What you don't hear about is all the other companies that didn't figure it out because they've all disappeared. And this management system is not complicated and most people create software around it, each of these companies has. The problem is they don't make that software available to the public. So each company then has to recreate what that system is and then turn it into their own software. So that's when people call me like, Matt, what do I do? And all I'm doing is sharing like a conglomeration of the best practices from those companies that I just mentioned. Um, but the real answer here is again, as I shared before, is just don't hire the people because the people are what create the problem that you then have to coordinate them all. And it's so hard to coordinate. And so I, my answer is I would, I wish that people didn't call me. I wish that people didn't need me and they wouldn't need me. You know, Kari Sarnan at Linear doesn't need me. We talked and I was like, Kari, you're, you got 20 people. You don't, you don't have problems. You're, you're fine. He's like, yeah, I agree. So I don't coach Kari because he doesn't need me. And that would be my wish for everybody that everybody stayed at that level. And, and instead of trying to, when you have to scale, instead of the easy answer is to just hire lots of people. In fact, that's what your investors want to do because that's what they've seen. They haven't seen the company that has scaled without hiring lots of people. But if you think about each action, like for example, Parker Conrad at Rippling. What's a, what's a one thing that you know? Huge number of people is customer support. He said, "You know what? I'm not going to do customer support. I'm not going to do live humans. I want to make it automated." Now, is it as good as live customer support? Eh, no, it's not. It's not as satisfying. But the product is so damn good that people say, "I'm willing to take that trade." 
and Rippling is growing like a weed and no live human customer support. At least the last time I checked, maybe they've changed that. So there are ways that you can scale massively without scaling massively in humans. And that's my recommendation. Yeah, and it's an important reminder that the size of the company is not necessarily directly correlated to success, right? Maybe even inversely correlated because of all the management overhead, lost knowledge across people. And at some that's point right. you need to scale, right? Um, and, and I think that's gonna be inevitable, but at least until you find product market fit, it is really important to keep the team small and, and, and learn yourself as a founder. This is where I love founder-led sales until at least product market fit, if not longer. Because I think sales from zero to one is like sort of sales, but a lot of it is just like product management. You're, you're learning from customers on what to build, what to prioritize, what not to prioritize. And you take that knowledge back to the engineering team. And if you just delegate that, I think you're going you're gonna to lose all that. Oh, let's be clear. Pre-product market fit, founder must run product and sales because they're the same thing, as you point out. And sales is go to a customer saying, hey, what are your problems? They describe them. You go away, create a solution, come back and say, I create a solution for you. Let's try it. And then future sales are, do you talk to someone saying, do you have this problem? The same problem this guy has. Da, 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 da. And they go, yeah, I do. Great. Here's a solution for you. Or ask them what their problem is. They say it. Go, great. I think I heard you say this is your problem. Da, 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 da. Is that right? And they go, yeah, you understand me. Great. Here's a solution for you. Oh, because you understand me, I trust you to try your solution. You cannot outsource that conversation. Until you understand what the problem is that you are solving, you yourself, the founder, must do the discovery and talk to the customers and ask them what their problems are. Can't outsource that. You can hire a head of sales to go take a sales script and a sales motion that already exists and already works, and they can go hire 10 other sales reps and train them on the sales motion. But I don't know a single sales executive that can go create the sales motion from scratch. Not one. That's got to be the founder. Just as I don't know a single product executive that can go create the product from scratch. That's got to be the founder. You can hire a product executive to go do all the wireframes and manage all the PMs and that part they can do. But going and talking to the customer, understanding the problem, knowing and creating the solution, that's a founder. Yeah. yeah. And if they, if they can do it, they do do it. They go and become their, they start their own company. So don't ever expect someone you hire to be able to solve the big problem. Yeah. Yeah. They can well, just, re they can just repeat the solution. They can't create the solution. Yeah. What advice would you give founders to thrive in this current macro, right? Fundraising is harder. Obviously there's like layoffs left, right and center. We may be heading into a deep recession. Customers may cut budget. It's a, it's a pretty volatile time to be building a company. But I do believe that certain set of companies will come out of this even stronger, right? Than if it wasn't for all this craziness. But I think it'll take a certain kind of mindset execution. Any, any, I'm sure you're having this conversation with your clients uh, today. A lot of them are obviously are facing a challenging macros. What, what should founders do? Well, there's, again, there's two different blocks. There's those that have already scaled and those that are pre-scaling, they're in product market fit. I coach almost exclusively folks that are, have already scaled massively. And I have the benefit of coaching the top CEOs and the top companies. So when times were good, they all raised. So they all have tons of cash. And then when the times got bad and we realized, oh shit, then we realized we've got to get to cash flow positive right now. And the biggest determinant of cost is people. And so both in March of 2020 and in May of 2022, each of the companies that I coach, almost all of them cut payroll significantly, like layoffs, large layoffs. And what we learned in March of 2020, that we did by necessity. We didn't, we thought, oh my God, there was going to be a big hit on company performance. And what we found was within two months, not only did, was there not a hit, actually each company was performing better. Some laid off 5%, some laid off 40%. And each and every company performed better. So when this time around came, there was much less fear. I just put the experienced CEOs with the new CEOs and said, hey, actually, your company's going to perform even better. 
And so then the layoffs became even more, even deeper. We had companies that laid off 50% of the company and they also are performing significantly better now. So that's the first thing in these times, if you have a scaled company and you are burning significantly, you need to cut costs massively and know that your company will actually perform better if you do. Now, of course you need to do so kindly, humanely. Don't ever lay people off by sending out a mass email or letting them know their job is gone if they haven't you know, started yet in an email or a Slack message or a group video or anything like that. It's gotta be the first time they learn that their job is gone. They're hearing it one-on-one -on -one with their manager who then also commits to helping them have a soft landing, a significant amount of severance to get them through until they find their next job, active participation from the manager in being their agent in discovering and finding that next job, things like that. Um, so that's the first thing you gotta do. If you're pre-product market fit, I think you gotta realize that the, 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 the most significant way to, if, if you discover customers that have a problem and it's a real problem, and they should be willing to pay you to develop the solution. I have, I have a company, all my CEOs have asked me to create software to implement my methodology through, so that they can just, as Apple has created theirs and Facebook and Google. And they said, Matt, why don't you create it? I was like, okay, but if you want me to, you've got to pay for it. You've got to pay for the developers. So all of my coaches are paying for the development. And I take all that money and pay the developers to create the software, which we've now done. And if I can do it, you can do it. So if your customers really want this problem solved, they will pay you to solve it. You don't actually even need the investment dollars. And so, yes, these are lean times. Great. Find the money from your customers. I think it's a really good litmus test too, right? For whether you're solving a real problem or not. I think in good times, some, you know, um, mediocre ideas can get funded or founders end up running after them because they got the wrong signal. Maybe some customers paid for it and you think there's a there there, but there actually may not be. And a lot of times I think the biggest um, downside in these cases are actually not even the venture dollars. It's the time of these very talented founders who end up working on subpar ideas when they should be keeping the bar even higher. And I think times like this truly uh, give you a, a real real sense of whether this is actually a good idea, actually a good space, actually a good problem to solve. And I think that's, that's exactly a, right. yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really, that's a positive, I guess, you yes. know, in this yes. crazy absolutely approach. huge positive. I think when founders think of problems that you go solve, they should talk to customers, ask them, what are your top three problems? And as they talk to those customers and they find a commonality, they should pick one of those top three problems to, to solve. You do not want to be working on problem seven, eight, nine, 10 that someone has. You know why? Because they don't care about problem seven, eight, nine, 10. The only thing that each of us cares about is our top three problems. That's it. If you're working on anything else, you're working on something that's, it's going to be hard to sell, frankly. That's right. That's right. Uh, we've got a minute left. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap here, Matt, this has been an incredible uh, conversation. Uh, any recommendation or advice you would have for founders? You know, obviously you've got a book that you've very kindly distributed for free. It's, the link is available online. We'll share that in the chat here. Your curriculum, you have open sourced and made that available as well. So those are awesome resources we can turn to. What else, like what other advice would you have for founders, especially early stage founders? They can't maybe afford a coach. You know, you have no time to coach too many founders. Where, where can we continue this? How can we extend this discussion as we, as we look to build our companies? I found the, the most valuable thing in being a CEO is uh, community and knowing that the things that I'm experiencing are not unique. I'm not alone. And so having a group of four five, six, seven other founders is invaluable. And you, and you might, the founder might think, well, I don't know those people. How do I create it? How do I join a group like that? Well, you don't join a group. You create it and you say, hey, you pick one other person, one other founder, that's all you need and say, I'm going to meet with this person, agree with that person meeting a time and a place to meet. And then when you agree on that time and place, each of you tries to find two or three other founders to invite. And then the first meeting happens. And during the first meeting, probably just the two of you will show up. No one else will show up. But the key is then you have a second meeting, maybe a month later. 
And then a third meeting. Commit to three meetings, no matter how shitty the first one is. Because by the time you get to the third, you'll have tons and tons of founders join you and all will be thanking you so much for having created this group because they all need the same thing. And then you can whittle it down from there and pick like the five to eight that you want to continue with and then meet monthly. Just that for two to three hours. That's it. If you do that, first of all, you'll gain a group of absolutely best friends for life and you'll gain so much psychological comfort. Um, and it's easy to do. And everybody's waiting around for someone else to do it. Be the hero. Do it yourself. Everyone yeah. will love you for it. And I guess what you're saying is like YPO, I guess, is one organization. But you can create your own community. You don't need YPO. You don't need to join something that already exists. And uh, and I think what you're also saying is like you don't necessarily need an expert, right, per se. I mean, it'd be great. But just your fellow travelers on this journey, that that may be enough, right? For you to learn from each other, for you to share best practices, um, and and it's not just a emotional kind of community and a circle of trust, but also like learning learning from from each other. That's exactly right. Got it, Matt. Thank you so much. I know you've got a busy schedule. You you live in Hawaii. You you're post economics. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom with uh, with founders today. This has been incredible. Thank you so much, Gwarvi.